Okay, I'm Krista Sammons, and most recently I was curator of the Yale Collection of German Literature. But I started out at the Beinecke in 1968 as what we call desk attendant, and that was out at the public services access desk. And that was before there was technical services or um, public services and administrative services. We all just did everything, so we stood at the desk half the day and then processed manuscripts and stuff the other half of the day. And then all along about 1970 or so, I was given the job as librarian of the German literature collection because the incumbent retired and left for Germany. And there I was, and they said, if, well, if you want to hold this job, you have to get a library degree. I already had a PhD from Yale. So if I went to Southern Connecticut State College, it was called then, and got a library degree, and finally I became curator, which I was until 2010 when I retired. So 42 years was some time out for maternity leaves. How has the Beinecke changed over the years? And I'm sure other people in this project will talk about more recent times, but the first change I noticed um, was a change from collecting books to manuscripts. And when I first came here, the focus of attention was Samuel Johnson and collecting bibliographically. So you collected every edition of an 18th century book, say, and you collected the Dublin copy with the misprint on page 26, and you accumulated all these things to make a complete bibliographic record. And somewhere along the line, and I, I haven't studied when the date was, we began to acquire archives. And this changed the whole way the institution worked, and I think it also drove many of the building renovations because so much more space was needed, and the, now the, uh, the way we've expanded to, to Whitney Avenue and, and the way we, just the way we do business and the way our readership has changed as well. So that was the first change I noticed, and I suppose the second change was when I, I came here, we did much handwriting we would have to write by hand all sorts of things. Every manuscript somebody used would be written down on a piece of paper by hand. And then around 1985, 86, we suddenly got computers. And it, all, it sometimes seemed to me we went from like 18th century writing by hand to 20th century doing computers with the typewriters sort of mushed in there somewhere in between. But that was a big change, that one didn't have to write by hand so much. And um, now people don't even have to write call slips by hand, which must be a great innovation because some people don't write very clearly and it's hard to know what book they want. So Marjorie Wynn was my first boss at the Beinecke Library. And she could be very, what my grandmother called, precise. Um, the way you dressed was important. You mustn't come to work messy. <laughs> and you had to, when you did all this handwriting, it had to be a certain way. For instance, when you made a four, it had to close at the top, make a little triangle. And when you made an A, it mustn't be a cursive A. It must be an A, as in Roman type, with a little round thing and a shelf on the top. And we were disciplined in these things. And uh, Marjorie kind of ran the library. I mean, there were the gentlemen, the curators, and then there was this group of all young women at that point who worked at the front desk, and Marjorie was in charge of us. And uh, I remember the day, well, I'll backtrack a little. The librarian at that point was Fritz Liebert. Herman W., but he was always called Fritz. And he decreed that the ladies who worked at the Beinecke had to wear skirts. There would be no trousers. Now, now we're in the late 60s when all the banking ladies in New Haven went around in pantsuits, you know, the little tight jackets with the bell-bottom trousers. It was 69, 68, around in there. But Fritz said we could not wear those garments. 
to work in the Beinecke Library. We had to wear skirts. So Marjorie, who was a very fashionable person, as you know, arrived one morning at the Beinecke Library in a Jeffrey Bean pantsuit, gray with pinstripes and a, and a matching newsboy cap. And she spent her day at work, and no one said anything. And the next morning, all of us ladies came to work <laughs> in trousers. So we had a little dress code rebellion at the Beinecke in the late 60s. And I mean, they were much more discreet than some of the miniskirts we were wearing back then. And then there was, of course, Donald Gallup in the American Literature Collection, who was not the founder, but the person who made it into the great manuscript collection it is today. Uh, Donald held forth in what is now the director's office. Um, it seems to me that the uh, Gertrude Stein chairs were in the office, along with many paintings from the American Literature Collection. And Donald was a formidable person. And at that point in time, many people were coming to use manuscripts in the American Literature Collection, and they needed permission. There were many restrictions on the collection. and. Donald was the one who knew. And so every time anyone asked to look at a manuscript in American literature, you would have to run to Donald's office and ask him if this person were permitted to look at this manuscript. And Donald was a very busy man, and he didn't like to be disturbed. So it was very scary to go there and possibly disturb his train of thought and ask if this poor scholar might look at Ezra Pound or Gertrude Stein or William Carlos Williams or whoever it was that day. But one day I went into Donald's office and he was very busy, typing away probably, and I had to ask my question. And suddenly he needed a paper clip from his drawer and he pulled open the drawer and I saw lined up in his drawer baby food jars with his clips and his paper fasteners and his rubber bands. And all at once, my whole image of Donald softened. And I later found out that he had many nieces and nephews whom he loved dearly. And that's how he came by the, by the baby food jars. Um, after Donald retired, he, as you know, he wrote two memoirs, Pigeons on the Granite, and what's the other one called? These Mad Pursuits, which is a quote from Edward Lear. And I became the editor of these books, these memoirs. So I was editing the editor, as we said, because Donald, for years and years and years, was the editor of the Yale University Library Gazette. And by this time, you know, I had mellowed out with Donald, and it was fine. And we had a good time with these, these two books, editing and going. He would come in every morning and edit we would discuss my proposed changes, which really weren't very many, but and I would ask him questions and say, well, you know, everybody doesn't know this, Donald. You need to explain a little bit here. Because Donald was not a big on explaining. When he made exhibitions, the labels tended to say, this is the first edition of XYZ, and that was <laughs> the whole label. So it's, he presumed you knew your stuff. So, But we got on fine with the books, and uh, he had a chapter on Georgia O'Keeffe, which really amused me. As many, most of the chapters just were a recitation of how he met the person and what they did and when they went to lunch and who paid for it. And it was very precise and chronological, and it was based on his retained correspondence with the person. But he got to Georgia O'Keeffe, and he was an artist that he visited in the Southwest. And she must have been a very expansive, digressive type, imaginative person. And it didn't fit Donald's chapter form of I met Georgia here, and then we did this, and then we had lunch. And, and, and what did he do? And you can look at the book. This is in the first one. He arranged it by topics. What Georgia said about teapots, what Georgia said about well, whatever, the, I remember the teapots, but there were paintings, snakes, the desert, and he arranged them in alphabetical order. I mean, what else does a librarian do <laughs> with a chaotic situation but, but arrange it in alphabetical order? So we had a great time with it. There were actually, he owned two original Georgia O'Keeffe's that he bought from her. Um, 
And at one time I knew the price that he paid for these paintings, and I mean, you can imagine how much they appreciated during his ownership. But I remember he, we needed to have these photographed, these two paintings to put in the book, and he, we had to take them to a studio that was on Willow Street near the old East Rock School. And he didn't have a car, and I said, Donna, let me drive you with the paintings to this place. No, he would not have it. He would walk. He walked everywhere. So he put his two Georgia O'Keeffe paintings in a brown paper shopping bag and carried them from his apartment, which was in that neighborhood, over to the studio in Willow Street. And, you know, I just imagine an elderly gentleman going through the street with this brown paper bag and somebody decides they'll attack him and they find these two, you know, gray, nondescript paintings in his bag and they put their foot through them and I had the horrors. I mean, I, but all went well and we had the photographs of the paintings in the book. Um, and that was Donald. He was a very frugal man. Um, no one saw the inside of his apartment not even Marjorie, who was his very close friend. Um, I hope he wasn't a lonely man. <laughs> so back in the so back in the 1960s, when I started to work here, you know, it was the day, and the plaza was always full of students, either you know being groovy or in high revolt. Those, those were really the days. And one very sunny noon, the quadrangle out there was full of kids. And E.J. Beinecke had come to visit Fritz Liebert, the director. And they had a conference in Fritz's office, I presume. And I bet E.J. wrote a big check, as he like, often did. Um, so they got to be noon and they decided they would go out to lunch. So they came upstairs and proceeded out through the revolving door and made their way past the courtyard. And there was an undergraduate sitting on the wall of the courtyard looking down at the Noguchi sculptures. And he said in a very loud voice, I wonder who's the damn fool who paid for those things. And E.J. walked up to him and said, I'm the damn fool who paid for those things. And then they proceeded to Maury's for lunch. Thank <laughs> you.